Hotel accommodations for this episode of Beyond Your Backyard were provided by the Omni Shoreham Hotel. The Omni Shoreham Hotel, luxurious resort accommodations in the heart of Washington, D.C. I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Fantastic experiences await you just beyond your own backyard. So join me for the next 30 minutes as we learn more about, explore, and eat our way through Washington, D.C. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel. And I still do today. Airlines, hotels, cruises, new places, delicious food, I love all of it. And that's why I've been traveling the world professionally for more than a decade. But what troubles me these days is that Americans are leaving paid vacation time on the table each year at an alarming rate. Well, I want to help fix that. So please consider this a personal invitation to join me each week on my mission to get you traveling more than ever before. Because while the world is a pretty big place to explore, your next vacation is waiting to be discovered not just around the globe, but perhaps just around the corner. Let me introduce you to the places, people, and secrets I've discovered that remind me just how exciting it is to be alive and hopefully will inspire you to get out of the house and into your next great adventure. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome to the District of Columbia. You know, this is gonna be a phenomenal episode. There are literally thousands of reasons for you to make a trip here, and today we're gonna to show you a few of my favorites. But have you ever stopped to consider why Washington DC is a district and not a state? Or why they moved the seat of government here? We'll answer those questions on today's show. We'll also learn more about the charters of freedom, why they're important, and we'll show them to you. And we're gonna get in the kitchen with a famous DC chef whose infectious personality is, well, frankly, out of this world. Let's get started. As we take a look at our map, you would note, if we had time to count them all, that the United States is comprised of 50 states. But the District of Columbia isn't included in that list because Washington, D.C. is a district and not a state. Washington, D.C. is located here along the eastern seaboard in the eastern time zone. The entire D.C. metropolitan area is comprised of about 6.5 million people. Getting here is easy, with three airports in and around the region. Those would be Dulles, Reagan, and BWI for short. Interstate 95 and the Beltway, which is 495, are major interstates which will prove useful if you're arriving by car. It's pretty safe to say Washington, D.C. is a classic American city beating with a unique energy. Movers and shakers, lobbyists, government officials and employees, residents and visitors all coexist in this famous eastern seaboard destination. Monuments, memorials, museums, amazing restaurants, big parks, unique treasures, live music and theater, it's way more than you could possibly do in one trip. About 22 million people visit Washington, D.C. each year and some arrive here. This is Union Station. It's home to Amtrak. And if you've got the time, Amtrak can take you from sea to shining sea and more than 500 points in between. Oh, by the way, this is the main hall, and it's pretty spectacular. If you're arriving by train, Union Station will connect you to DC subway called the Metro, or you can hop in a cab to nearby hotels and sites. But this famous Eastern Seaboard destination is also a company town. And that company is the United States federal government. You know, over hundreds of years, the U.S. has emerged as a world superpower. But what's in a name? Why is it we have 50 states and Washington is a district and not a state? Washington, D.C. is a district and not a state because Congress was concerned about the power that would be in the hands of whoever got the capital of the United States. Got it. They wanted the capital of the United States to be independent of any individual state and they also wanted to control it. At the time, uh, it was a political compromise. And you have to remember that just about everything that we hold as our constitution, as the founding principles of this nation, all of those things were political compromises. Flash forward more than 200 years later, is it still a good idea? It is not a good idea. We in the District of Columbia do not have the same rights of citizenship that people have in every state in the union. The population of the District of Columbia is larger than a few of our states, but yet all the people who live here do not share those rights of citizenship. 
Will it look and feel different as a state resident versus a district resident? Now, the city council passes laws all the time, and those laws are the will of the people of the District of Columbia. Yet at this moment, without our having the full rights of democracy, Congress has the right to veto any of our laws. Congress can impose laws on us if they feel like it. <laughs> and that doesn't happen anywhere else. I'm sure. Will that mean we will have then 51 states? You will got we it. count right? 51 states, 51 stars on the flag. Do you think there's some sort of opposition in, in the notion that there, maybe there are people sitting around going, 50 is such a nice round number. Like, what? And now we're going to have, we're going to have to redo all that stuff. There are always plenty of people who are resistant to change. But some changes are essential. But for a population as large as ours here in the District of Columbia, and not have the rights that everybody else has, you know, the right to govern ourselves primarily. When did this notion or discontent begin to surface? Oh, the residents of Washington figured it out right away. When this capital was set up here in this location, this was farms and plantations. There was, there were two small towns. One was called Georgetown and one was called Alexandria. <laughs> Alexandria being in Virginia and Georgetown being in Maryland. The District of Columbia was carved out of those two states. And the initial idea was that the laws governing those two pieces in Maryland and Virginia would continue in the new district until such time as the District of Columbia worked out its own government. But nobody intended it to not have rights. This was before modern transportation. It was before modern communications. The states were actually fighting over who got to have the capital because they would be close to the federal government and they would be able to influence it, they figured, because they were right there. They weren't going to have to wait um, you know, a month for a letter to come from South Carolina. And one of the, uh, the principles that was considered was what is central to the nation? At the time. At the time. At the time. So you look at the map, what's central to the nation at the time, it's where we're standing. The capital hasn't always been in the District of Columbia, correct? The seat of government came up before the revolution. It was the intercolonial Congress that came together in 1774. It's where the colonies came together as a Congress, which meant simply a group of people talking to each other. Sure. And that's where the seeds of revolution were planted, which led to 1776 and the Declaration, right? And at that point, uh, Congress moved around a fair amount. Uh, Congress, most importantly, was in Philadelphia for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and Congress decided to leave Philadelphia in 1783 and moved out of there, went to Princeton, New Jersey. Who knew? Right. Uh, in fact, at one point, it was in York, Pennsylvania. And Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is very proud of the fact that they were the seat of government for one day when Congress was on the way, on the way. to York. <laughs> um, so it ended up in New York. And New York City was where George Washington took the oath of office. And New York City is where um, the Compromise of 1790 was worked out, which placed D.C. here where we are today. When we go back to George Washington, who planned the city with Peter L'Enfant, his planner and architect, uh, they were really trying to create a city for the ages. And so they did that in terms of where they placed the branches of government on the landscape. So the White House is really a, f a long way from the Capitol. They planned for the ages as best they could. They created a city of very wide avenues at a time when people got around on horses and horses and buggies and they needed very little room, but the avenues are wide. And today we're grateful for that because we need them for the cars. Right. So they did that. In terms of the uh, commitment of the Congress though to keeping the Capitol here, they could move it if they felt like it. They well, really could do that today if they wanted to. And, and historically, there have been moments when they tried to move it. Really? Yes. Uh, after the War of 1812, when the British came in and burnt out most of our public buildings, they said, you know, let's get out of here. And the local population and the president decided, no, we're going to stay, because if we move, that will show that the British won. So we're going to stay. It's a matter of patriotism. And then after the Civil War, oh my goodness, the Civil War beat this city to shreds. Mm -hmm. It was in terrible condition. And again, and there we have many more states now, right? Congress is saying, let's get out. Let's move somewhere. Let's move somewhere that's more central now. Right. It's no longer central. So let's go to St. Louis. Historical hindsight's always 2020. <laughs> we always look back and say, why in the world they do that? That's crazy. Well, was this a good idea to move it here? 
I think putting it here uh, was a great idea because it was central, which is what they were looking for, mm -hmm. because it was inland so that if some European power wanted to attack us from a ship, they couldn't reach us. Mm -hmm. We are uh, up, up the Potomac River, we are not on the Chesapeake Bay, which was a possibility. Um, was it a good idea? It's a beautiful place to be. And by the way, it was never a swamp. I'd like to get that in there. I think we should definitely get that, that in because you do read, oh, DC was built on a swamp. That's no. not actually accurate. DC was not built on a swamp. Got it. It's hard for me to answer that question objectively because I was born here. Mm -hmm. Um, my children were born here. I'm very proud of being a, a Washingtonian, and I love this city because it is such a beautiful place mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. um, for those of us who live here, every day we walk around and, and look at the federal presence, the architecture, and we are grateful for that. We also look at our neighborhoods, which are lovely places too, and we are grateful for those. Armed with a wealth of knowledge Jane provided, I decided, after our conversation, it was time to see the sights. The act of visiting monuments in Washington, D.C. is as American as, well, apple pie. Admission to the monuments, well, it's free. All of the Smithsonian museums are free to visit. Tours of the White House are free, but must be arranged in advance through your local legislator's office. And a Capitol Gallery Pass is also available if you check with your local representative or senator's office. These buildings are iconic and one-of-a-kind works of art. Well, speaking of art, the art of the written word is near and dear to me. Every time I visit here, I get kind of sentimental about our little democracy. Well, this is the National Archives, and inside, you'll find some of the most important documents in this nation's history. Let's go in. What can visitors see when they come? There are 20 billion records here at the National Archives, so there is something for everybody. Is there a, a right way or the best way to see everything, in your opinion? Or? You can't see all of them when you come and visit, but you can see the Declaration, Constitution, and Bill of Rights. It's usually the ones people are most excited to see. So we have letters uh, from the Founding Fathers. We have telegraphs. So for example, Lincoln sent a whole bunch of telegraphs to his troops. We have all of those. We have recordings. So we have fireside chats uh, from World War II. We have those recordings. We have wax cylinders of Teddy Roosevelt. You can come and hear his voice and see his pictures. And then we have other kind of more artistic things uh, like architectural drawings or uh, posters from various wars. You can see naval logbooks. So if you're a little bit more military focused, we have something for you too. Is there a better way or the right way to attack coming to see the archives? I mean, it, it, it's such a massive place. We have 15 to 20 billion records, not all on display, but you can see a variety of different sorts of things from letters, to telegrams, to recordings. We even have websites and tweets, so we keep everything. But I usually start the opposite of what most people do. I start downstairs in our Records of Right exhibit. It kicks off with a copy of the 1297 Magna Carta. It talks about people wanting to have a voice in their government and participate in their government. And then I go into the public vaults. That's our exhibit that talks about the 20 billion other kinds of records we have here at the archives. The things that have been produced as Americans have participated in the government and their government has worked for them. And then I come into the Rotunda, where our charters of freedom are. So you can really wrap up your visit with, hey, these are the documents that kicked off all the other things that I've seen today. What do people not know about the National Archives? Usually it's how many other records we have and that you can always find yourself here at the National Archives. It can be a very personal experience. Uh, we always ask school groups who are visiting, if you're older than 10, do you think you can find yourself in the National Archives? And you can, we have census records. So eventually you can, if you've ever written a letter to the president, you can find that letter here in the National Archives and our holdings. And if you have a relative who served in the military, we will have their military records in our holdings. So it is something that shows the life of not just the government, but the citizens of the United States. Best time of day to visit? The fall and winter, there are fewer visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you come in the mornings, I tend to not see as many crowds then. And it's worth noting that this is the Rotunda. It is indeed. Why is it so dark in here? It's for preservation of the records. So if you've ever seen any of these documents, they've kind of lived within an inch of their life. They've been around since the founding of our country. Uh, they're really faded, and light just fades them more. And so we want to keep it pretty dark so that we don't fade them more. And for those of us who want some bonus points, what would be the difference between the National Archives and the Library of Congress? 
So it's, if you think back to those high school days, it's all about primary versus secondary sources. We have primary source material, things created during particular time periods. The Library of Congress, we love them, they're great. They have a lot of secondary source material, stuff that helps contextualize what we have and analyzes it. I'm sensing a competition. Do you guys have like softball teams you compete? Well, just a friendly one, usually friendly. trivia nights. <laughs> it's trivia night. <laughs> U.S. history? Always. Ah, <laughs> After viewing the Charters of Freedom, touring the galleries, and reaffirming my sense of national pride, the crew and I did work up an appetite. Ham-handed sandwich transition? You bet. As you can imagine, Washington, D.C. is a melting pot of cultures. Uh-huh. Sticky puns notwithstanding, I suggest you come to D.C. ready to sample dishes from classic steakhouses, street food, and authentic ethnic cuisine from Chinatown and the like. My choice? I stayed downtown for comfort cuisine with a twist. This is Brian's Comfort Kitchen, and this is Chef Brian. How did you decide this is the place you want to be? I needed to make certain that people that no matter how much money they make can afford my cuisine. That's why there are only nine items on the menu, and the most expensive, I hope you're sitting down, oh <laughs> is $13. Really? Why? I grew up in Petworth, okay. Northwest DC, okay. 70s Petworth. It was bad back then, and you know, a lot of bad things going on. Now it's beautiful, but we were poor. And actually, we weren't poor, we were poor. We had to save up some poor. I knew that after being poor and my mother burns hard boiled eggs, I knew that I wanted to give people the same food that I've always been cooking and that I love for a great price, no matter how much money they make. What are we going to expect when we get here? What are we going to eat? What Everyone loves, in what I used to make for Mary J. Blige, are the golden fried chicken sliders. Okay. So you have ch uh, cutlets of chicken yep. marinated overnight, deep fried until golden. Um, literally, we just have potato rolls, but they're bigger. So they don't really look like sliders, it looks like a small burger. Got it. So literally, you just toast those with a paprika and tarragon mayo, banana pepper, the other bun, uh, a nice little fancy frill, should we go make some? I'm going to say yes. Let's go make some. Boneless chicken breasts. What's already happened? Marinating. Got fresh tarragon. Uh, garlic. Got it. And sea salt and a little sriracha. Sriracha. That's right. Just for a little Buttermilk. That's it. And right in the seasoned flour. Anything with the flour? Uh, it's just seasoned. With? With Lowry seasoned salt. Done and done. That's it. And no MSG. And so you're gonna dip right in, and you know what the perfect temperature for deep frying is? No. 350. I didn't know that. That's right, look at that. Oh, I lost, I lost my glove. Oh, no. no I'm getting nice <laughs> All right, now what happens if we don't have a deep fryer at the house? Um, you can shallow fry. Okay. So I use canola oil at home. So maybe you have a cast iron pan. Yep. Yeah. And you just make sure you do medium high, yeah. and for about three and a half minutes on each side. That's it. Done. And pull it. My, mouth, my mouth is actually watery. Instead of it going in for so long, now you have this succulent chicken that comes out because if it stays in the fire for too long, what happens is you get this heaviness and it's not as crisp and it's not as gold and it looks like a wrinkle, it looks like a, a raisin. And will, and will the chicken dry? The chicken will dry out immediately, right? Then well, it'll already be dry because yeah. it's in for too long. Ooh. So now it looks like a raisin and it's dry. So what I'm doing right now, I'm doing the paprika and tarragon mayo. Okay. So on both sides we do it though, right? Right. And then, Yep, that's the bottom. Okay. And then we do banana pepper. Yep. Top. Hold on, where's my frill? But people think, look, people say, oh, well, you know, it's hard. Yeah, I gotta fry something. It's complicated. It's not. We're gonna stick the dismount right over there. Okay, okay I'm gonna say yes. I like that. We can do it. Okay, Chef, what are we looking at here? This looks amazing. This is the Chesapeake salmon salad. Think of a tuna salad or chicken salad mixed with mayo, fresh tarragon, uh, California golden raisins, chopped green onions, and a bit of arugula with the golden fried tortilla chips mm -hmm. that Mary J. Blige called addictive chips. We can't use no, the word. No, addictive chips. Okay. That's good, okay. Which one, number two? Sliders. The yep. golden fried chicken sliders with a paprika and tarragon mayo. Now, the cutlets are hand cut, so marinate overnight with a uh, potato roll, um, the the, the uh, tarragon mayo, mm -hmm. and of course the banana pepper, and 
The hand roll homemade turkey meatballs. Got it. Eight grams of fat per serving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the sauce, okay, the sauce, mm -hmm. amazingly beautiful and vegan. Um, oven roasted tomato and garlic sauce. Instead of using heavy whipping cream, we use coconut milk. Really? Ladies and gentlemen, and, oh, and a little more sauce. Sauce it up. Get your, get your Ooh, yeah. Because I always say to my, my employees, I'm like, it should be swimming in sauce. Absolutely. Swimming in sauce. Fun. And look, 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 look at that. That's succulent. We call that flavor country. Okay. Cheers. Perfect. What? When I think of Washington, D.C., I think of monuments, the Capitol or the White House or the Oval Office, for instance, which is where we are today. Okay, well, we're not in the real Oval Office. That kind of access would be huge. But getting back to my point, you can take a tour of this Oval Office replica at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum in College Station, Texas, which in the interest of shameless series promotion is featured in an upcoming episode of Beyond Your Backyard. Getting back to my point, though, when you think Washington, D.C., you may not think the great outdoors. Well, I am here to help fix that. That's why we made a stop at Fletcher's Boathouse on the Potomac. Alex, can anybody get out on the water like this? Absolutely, we get beginners all the time. How did you know I was a beginner? <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this. I can tell, I've been here long enough. <laughs> it's the jacket, <laughs> yeah. I know, I understand. Uh, so what can you do while we're out here? Uh, well, we have kayaks, canoes, rowboats, uh, stand-up paddle boards, just bicycles if you prefer to stay on land. Got it, because bicycling on the river, not exactly. <laughs> People always ask, on the beaten path and off the beaten path, and where do the locals go? This is a local spot. This is definitely a local spot, yeah. And if we were coming for the first First time, how long should we go out? People go out there for an hour, uh, sometimes two, on a nice day like this. You could do a couple hours easily. You want to go out there and try it out? I, I, I don't know about it. I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah, maybe we should. Stand up paddle boarding in the jacket? I'll put you in a kayak to start. A kayak. I think I'm more of a kayak kind of <laughs> fella. Bottom line here, take nature at your own pace. My stunt double. <laughs> Good job, Kevin. <laughs> Love that guy. While we're on the subject of nature, take a stroll in Rock Creek Park. Walk or jog along the CNO Canal towpath in Georgetown, or take a 30 minute drive out to Great Falls Park, home to the always popular Billy Goat Trail. This is the perfect place to explore nature. The 800 acres of scenic parkland consists of hiking trails, cascading rapids, and spectacular waterfalls. Washington, D.C. is a town full of energy and neighborhoods to explore like Georgetown and Foggy Bottom. Of course, we can't cover all of them in one episode. Close by, you can explore Fairfax County, Virginia. Take a tour of George Washington's beloved Mount Vernon, as I have done numerous times over the years. National Harbor in Maryland is also a fun place to visit. Or charming towns like Alexandria or Annapolis. The to-do and see list is seemingly endless. Now it gets a little cold in the winter and a little crowded in the summer, so perhaps make your trip in late spring or fall. So when it's time to plan your first trip or next trip to this iconic destination, I assure you this town will welcome you with open arms. I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Thank you for exploring beyond your backyard in Washington, D.C. That's why it's number, num number, number. Food is delicious. Something else is great. I love it. What has two thumbs and is excited to do another take? This guy. <laughs> For you over 40s out there, <laughs> you'll find some of the most famous documents in our nation's history. Yeah. <laughs> Camera's rolling, sound speed. Oh, it's time to do something. Oh, what are we doing? I think I'm having a heart attack. We do a line. We do a line. Eric the trailer guy, look out, folks. <laughs> Are we still rolling? Where'd the crew go? This is like Event Horizon all of a sudden. 
do it from the top. What? That's gold right there. <laughs>